Hello, how are you? Uh, I'm so glad to see you and glad that you want to continue our Bible study together. Uh, I want to offer you a, a vacation uh, this time, just, just a short vacation, just one of our sessions we're going to take away from Book of Matthew. Just put it on pause there in chapter four, end of chapter four, and, and we're going to go into uh, just a, a one, one a lesson series. I want to talk to you about a dream that I had, a dream. You know, a dream can be a powerful thing. On August 28, 1963, a 34-year-old black man stood on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial on a sweltering hot day. And he made a speech, the I have a dream speech. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr. spoke to over a quarter million people that day that were there in, in, on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial and then spread all the way down the sides of the reflecting pool, all the way down to the Washington Monument uh, in our nation's capital in Washington, DC. And, and made a, a, a speech, a, a passionate speech about a dream that he had for our country to usher in a, an era of greater racial equality and justice. And uh, I'll leave it to you to decide uh, how much progress we made on that dream uh, because uh, some people say this was the greatest speech of the 20th century. Uh, it, it was quite a powerful moment and, and led, I think, to the, the fact that today he is viewed as something of a, a national hero. We have streets, we have street in Oxford named after him. We have a national holiday coming up a week from Monday. Uh, his actual birthday is on uh, January 15th, but we celebrate it, I think, second or third Monday in, uh, in January every year. And, and so this, uh, this, this particular occasion his dream and his communication about that dream uh, really defined, I, I think, in a way, part of the era, part of the movement that he led, and, and certainly his, his legacy. If you don't mind, I'd like to jump over to a video recording of the last three, four minutes of that speech, and let's just watch it together and, and think about uh, together about the power of the dream. So let me get that set up for you here, if I can. into an oasis of freedom and justice, I have a dream. My four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. A dream that one day down in Alabama with its vicious racist, with its governor having his lips dripping with the words of interposition and nullification. Yeah. One day right there in Alabama, little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers. I have a dream today. dream that one day every valley shall be exalted. Every hill and mountain shall be made low. The rough places will be made plain and the crooked places will be made straight and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. This is our hope. This is a faith that I go back to the south with. With this faith. We will be able to hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope. With this faith, we will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. With this faith, we will be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, to stand up for freedom together, knowing that we will be free one day. This will be the day. This will be the day with all of God's children be able to sing with new meaning my country tears of thee sweet land of liberty of thee i sing land where my fathers died land of the pilgrims pride from every mountainside let freedom ring and if america is to be a great nation this must become true so let freedom ring from the prodigious hilltops of new hampshire let freedom ring from the mighty mountains of New York, 
Let freedom ring from the heightening Alleghenies of Pennsylvania. Let freedom ring from the snow-capped Rockies of Colorado. Let freedom ring from the crevacious slopes of California. But not only that, let freedom ring from Stone Mountain of Georgia. Let freedom ring from Lookout Mountain of Tennessee. Let freedom ring from every hill and mole hill of Mississippi, from every mountainside. Let freedom ring, and when this happens, and when we allow freedom ring, when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we are free at last. Well, that was uh, an exciting time, an exciting day, and people still get excited about the topic of, of justice, equality, and unity. We, we have a lot of discussion about what those really should mean and how we can achieve those things. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, they, they are, they're still exciting and popular topics. But that's not what I'm going to talk about today. I, I want to talk about a dream that I have that I feel just as strongly about as um, Martin Luther King Jr. felt about his dream. And, and I have a dream that, that our church congregation can be infected with a burning, ever more burning desire to be like the church that we read about in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter two, it talks about the beginning of that church and it talks about four main points of emphasis, a four part program, if you will, they had in that church. It said, first of all, that they devoted themselves to these four things. And so at least at the core, we had a group of people that were all in. They weren't associate members. They weren't casual members. They weren't once in three week members. They were all in. And the things that they were all in for were the apostles teaching, the fellowship, the breaking of bread and prayer. I'd like to talk about each one of those four pillars that support uh, this dream for just a minute. Uh, the, the first one is that they were devoted, and I, I can't stress that word enough, devoted to the apostles' teaching. Now, what does that mean? Jesus told his apostles to go and, and teach all the world, all ethnic groups, races, creeds, colors, you name it, to teach them everything he had commanded them. So when we look at the apostles teaching, we're, we're actually looking at the teaching of Christ. That he said, I have all authority, and so I'm gonna delegate to you this great task of spreading my teaching around the world. So I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in, in our church congregation becoming committed and having a vision that's based on the apostles teaching no more, no less. And, and that means that when people want to become Christians, when we uh, talk to people about their need for salvation, which we should do sometime uh, more often, that, that, that we're talking to them about belief, repentance, and baptism, because that's what we see practiced in Acts 2, and Acts 8, and Acts 9, and Acts 10, and Acts 11, and Acts 16, Acts 22, and so forth and so on. That's what people did. They, they believed they repented and they were uh, immersed in water. We, we're going to have an emphasis uh, against our culture on, on, on sexual purity and sexual morality, that, that, uh, that, that sex is for one man and one woman that are tied together for life by marriage. It's, it's, it's simple. It's there. And we're not going to be afraid to, uh, to be upfront about telling people about that. And that will lead into us uh, having a clear gender roles based upon the apostles' teaching. You know, we can have a lot of discussion about that, but, but if we're committed to the idea that there are gender roles and we should be able to figure them out some kind of way based on the, the scriptures, we, we can move ahead with that. We, we're going to be uh, committed to the idea that there is, in fact, a priesthood of all believers, that everybody has a responsibility for, for spreading the gospel, for interceding for others, for, for mediating for others with, with the Lord, that, that we are in fact a nation, a kingdom of, of priests. 
if 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 we if we if we don't see the 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 business of theology as being the domain of the specialist, you know that's 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 not what we read about in in the book of Acts because uh, they had a great they, they had some specialized roles within the body, but you know every the people preached the word wherever they went Acts eight three, and and this led to congregations that were that were uh, full of talented people who were using their talents for the Lord. You know in, in Acts thirteen it lists the, the teachers they had in that congregation that church at Antioch, and, and Saul of Tarsus is the last name on the list or next to last name. Uh, hey, you know what a great group of teachers. Uh, <clears throat> They, they. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking that when we're devoted to the apostles' teaching, that we will do as that church in Antioch did, and send out missionaries to teach the gospel to other countries uh, from among our own uh, number. I have a dream that my congregation will be devoted to the fellowship. That Greek word quantity is sharing a common life together, and, and instead of uh, you know a, a hurried 45 minutes once a week. That, that we will encounter one another, we will meet with one another almost daily. We read about a daily practice of, of Christianity, of interacting, of sharing life together in, in Acts 2, 46 and, and 47 and 542 and 1711, that you know this, this business of study, this business of, of uh, coming together to encourage one another, it was, uh, it was a daily habit that, that people that give sacrificially and that, that view that they have all things in common, have a great sense of, of sharing, that wash one another's feet, that laugh and cry together, that, that uh, when, when one is honored, they're, they're all honored, that submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And when people are this close together, <clears throat> conflict is inevitable, and, and so they will work together to solve uh, conflicts like Acts 6 and Acts 15. They'll, they'll have leaders that will sit down and, and listen to the whole thing and say, okay, group, uh, this is what we're gonna do, or we're gonna give you a choice. You tell us what you think is the best or which persons you think should, should handle this, this problem. I have a dream today that our church congregation can be more and more devoted to breaking bread. And so we wonder, breaking bread, does that mean we, have fellowship meals together. And, you know, when COVID's passed, we get back in this week. That's one thing our congregation does well. We do fellowship meals well, and we want to do more of them. You know, we want to do more of them and we want to do them better. And we want more people to come. But it also means the Lord's table, the Lord's supper. And, you know, heaven forbid that we make this a minor, a, a, a hurried, a rushed, a second thought. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm thinking that from time to time, we should have whole worship services that are just structured around that Lord's table. And of course we need to have it uh, every, every week, every week. <clears throat> uh, I'm, I'm thinking that being devoted to breaking bread means that we make uh, an overt attempt to break down uh, cultural barriers within the body. That uh, just like that, that group did back then that, that, that uh, you know, the, the gospel begins to spread. And so, you know, there may be some friction, Acts 6, with the, with the Grecian widows, and the, and, but, but it keeps spreading, it keeps spreading. Uh, you know, uh, they, they have uh, uh, the gospel preached to this guy from Ethiopia, um, obviously a proselyte, and chapter 8, and then in the latter half of chapter 8, there's the, the Samaritans, they're becoming Christians. And then in Acts chapter 10, uh, the, the uh, spreading of the gospel to the Gentile through the, the household of, of Cornelius. I have a dream today that my congregation will have a renewed commitment to prayer, to uh, praying through seasons when we just have to wait on the Lord, like the group of 120, 120 people did there in, in the first chapter of Acts, that uh, we will pray when we're selecting the leaders, as they did there in, in chapter 1 and verse 24, that we will pray when we're faced with uh, persecution, with, with bad press, with uh, troubles with those on the outside, as they did in chapter 4 and verse 24. In chapter 6, the apostle said, you, you choose seven men to handle this problem with food distribution because uh, it, as for us, we, we're going to delegate that because our, our focus is going to be on, uh, on teaching the word 
and prayer or teaching the word and prayer. And so these are the two key tasks for our elders. If the elders understand that and us members understand that, it, it, it liberates them to do what they've been really uh, called to do, what they've been asked to do. And, and that is to do the ministry of the word and, and prayer. <clears throat> we'll pray when we're ministering to the sick as they did in Acts and also when we're sending out uh, missionaries. Now, here's my biggest dream of all. For some of you my age, maybe a little bit older, maybe a little bit younger, boy, this sounds like an old song. This whole idea of restoring New Testament Christianity. But for younger people, not so much because we don't talk about it. We don't preach about it. We don't get excited about it anymore. It's kind of a secret. It's, it's kind of like buggy whips, you know, obsolete. You know, it's kind of like a manual typewriter. Maybe you've seen one of those. Maybe your mother, your aunt, your, your granddaddy may have had a manual typewriter, you know, but we just don't do uh, typewriters much anymore. It's all about that word processor and, and you know, those, uh, what we can do with our, with our thumbs on the, on the smartphone. <laughs> My biggest dream, though, is that this idea, this wonderful, powerful, terrific idea that we don't need anything else. It's all there. This, this uh, idea of, of total, unbelievable, cross-bearing commitment that we can, that we can recapture that. that we, we, can, we, we don't need anything other than the apostles' doctrine. We can be devoted to that, and, and, and it will be so powerful. But somehow, we, we need to find words and ways to communicate, to justify, to promote this dreams in a way that is relevant to 21st century culture. And, and it takes better minds, more creative minds than mine to do this. But somehow our best communicators have not gotten very excited about this task of, of what we used to call New Testament Christianity. I don't know why, I'm not sure why. In Oxford, <clears throat> when he's not out on the road, is a man I've, I've never met in person. I've never shook his hand, but I, I really love what he does. His name is Wright Thompson. Wright Thompson is a gifted sports writer. And he, he, he writes for uh, ESPN and, and uh, many other uh, outlets. Uh, just even if you don't like sports, you, you can really like reading what Wright Thompson writes. He collected a bunch of his essays in a book that was published a couple of three years ago called The Cost of These Dreams. The Cost. Now this book has got, uh, you know, it's a collection of essays and they're about all sorts of different things. But many of them have a common thread and that is, <clears throat> He studied the lives of, of really some of the greatest heroes of sports, coaches and athletes. And as he looked at these, at these athletes who had achieved so much in their particular sport, he, he looked at what it had cost them and their families, all the fame, all the fortune, all the accolades that, that they had won, what it took to get there had warped, had warped their relationships, had warped them, had made it Im almost impossible for them just to relax and enjoy life, to look back on their laurels and to be satisfied. It was quite a task. And so the, their dream of becoming the champion, the greatest ever, the G-O-A-T, as we call it, greatest of all time, had been a costly dream. And, and I have no doubt that living for Jesus, that being like that church in the book of Acts, like the brothers and sisters we read about in the book of Acts, that we'll be called upon to pay a high cost, to pay a high cost. Oh, we may not be thrown to the lines, but we may lose some money. We may miss some sleep. We may, you know, forego uh, a, a longer vacation or, or some personal luxury. Uh, we may have to follow Jesus every day 
and, and that is costly when you do it over a lifetime. Well, I, I shared my dream with you. Maybe you have some dreams you'd like to share back with me. You know how to, how to get in touch with me. Please continue to pray for me as I do for you. I promise next week we'll be right back in to uh, Matthew's gospel. Thank you for spending this time with me.